We're live. Tonight we're talking about exercise in water, uh, whether that's in a swimming pool, in a hot tub, or just in the bath. I appreciate that many people have decided it's getting too cold for hot tubs and swimming pools are a no-no and that some of you may have no longer got a bath if you put a wet room in instead and you've given up your bath for a wet room. But we still want to talk about the value of exercise in water and I specifically say exercise in water because it's not always swimming. When you speak to any physiotherapist in paediatrics, they will say swimming is absolutely the best exercise. Well, it is for non-weight bearing exercise, but obviously there are exercises that are good in weight bearing. You want weight through your bones, you want weight through your joints, you want weight through your spine. This is important. So it is the best non-weight bearing exercise. It's also good for all the body, because very often exercise misses out a bit of body, often shoulders and arms. And also it's good for breathing as well, because even if you're not putting your face in the water, swimming under the water, going on your tummy, the weight of the water on your chest forces you to breathe deeper and harder. Having said that, it is perfectly possible to go in a pool with full ventilation. I have been in a hydrotherapy pool, with a young lady of 19 who was on full-time BiPAP. And the only thing you need is extra long tubing. You need to be the only two in the water, unless you have another person just in case, actually just sitting in the water. But it is absolutely perfectly possible. The one area where I will not take somebody in the water, if they are fully ventilated, is if they require frequent suctioning because to actually then have to take them to the edge of the water to get them suctioned and come back is not feasible. But a child or a young person or even an adult who is fully ventilated who does not require suction for 20 to 30 minutes, there is absolutely no reason why you can't go in the water on full ventilation. Now, I know that there are children um, possibly adults, but I don't know. I do know there are children who've gone back to swimming. There is no thought that you can catch COVID in the water because obviously the water is heavily chlorinated in most cases. There are some other chemicals that they use in some places instead of chlorine, but there is no suggestion whatsoever that there is a possibility of catching COVID from being in the water. Obviously, if you are going in the water with a physiotherapist or with somebody who is not within your bubble, you need to be aware of either that person is not COVID positive or they are taking precautions. Now, some pools, the physiotherapists are wearing masks, which is a bit revolting if they get soggy and wet. And there are some pools where they're wearing visors, but obviously, each team has to work it out for themselves and each family has to work it out for themselves. In our actual pool, the parents sign a disclaimer saying that they are happy for the child to be in the water with a physiotherapist and we will wear a mixture of masks and visors. The children obviously will only wear masks if they want to wear masks in the water and if the parents are beside the pool, they will have to wear a mask. So we have to think about what is exercise in water? What good is it doing? And is a lot of what is done in the water actually good for you? Because I have to be honest and say, I have seen a lot of children in the water. I've seen a lot of pictures of children in the water and adults. And most of what they are doing is working their hip muscles. Now I have managed to detach one of my bendy men from their, um, support so we can do a lot of nice stuff that looks like swimming with Bendy Man tonight. Now one of the problems that we often get is that the children do a sort of froggy breaststroke style legs. They pull their hips and knees up and then push them out, pull them up and push them out. The problem is very often in the water you're getting a lot of 
work at the hips, a lot of work with bent knees, and ultimately that's not the best position you can be in in the water. Now there's going to be plenty of you out there who are thinking, oh, that's the best position, that's the easiest position, that's what we use, don't tell me that's wrong. Well, actually, I'm afraid it is. Spending a lot of time bending your hips up and bending your knees up is working your hip flexors, your knee flexors, your external rotators, not the muscles we want to work in the water. So let's go through generally where the weakness is and what we want to do. Now, if you are working on your own with your child or an adult partner, whatever, then you may not be aware of how to help them. And there are courses, there are hydrotherapy courses, there are swimming clubs, especially to help. But what we need to think about is that we want to do the same sort of exercises in the water, be it in the bath, in a hydrotherapy pool, in a hot tub, in a swimming pool, that we would do on dry land. It's just easier in the water to get movement. What it's not easier in the water to do is go on your tummy. And obviously there are children who do go on their tummy in the water, are very happy on their tummy in the water. Surprisingly enough, many, many type twos prefer to swim on their tummy and have somebody haul them out at a prearranged signal than swim on their back or try and swim with their head stuck out of the water. So actually swimming in the water is the easiest way to swim. But obviously we can't do that if you're ventilated. Swimming on your tummy or swimming under the water is actually one of the best ways to swim if you can do it. And the reason is you tend to be working your extensor muscles rather than your flexor muscles. So let's recap on the muscles that are the weakest in SMA, whether it be type one, type two or type three. The weakest muscles start off with your butt muscles, your gluteus maximus, your big gluteal muscle, the one that straightens your hips, the one that gets you up the stairs, gets you off the floor and keeps you upright when you're standing. That is one of the weakest muscles in SMA. Your tummy muscles are weak, your abdominals, and we know that because that's what causes a lot of the difficulty with breathing. And a lot of children can only make use of their diaphragm to help them breathe. So we know tummy muscles are weak, but the tummy muscles go all the way from the breastbone up here, all the way down to the bottom of the pubic bone, to the bottom of the pelvis. And deep inside the pelvis are your hip flexor muscles and psoas. There's two muscles, there's iliopsoas and rectus femoris, and they are the ones that bend your hips forward, pull your trunk forward, pull your pelvis forward, allow you to bend. And those are the ones that so often get tight in SMA, your hip flexors, because your tummy muscles are too weak to straighten you up, your bum muscles are too weak to counter it. The next muscles that are weak are your thigh muscles, your quadriceps. Those are the ones that straighten your knee, so that the ones that bend your knee, your hamstrings are always strong, and they will pull you into knee bend position. And I've, everybody knows that the last ones that are weak are the muscles that pull your feet upwards, that tip your toes towards your shins, and the ones that are strong are your ballet muscles that point your toes down, which is why we end up with pointy feet, stuck bent knees, stuck bent hips, and a squiggly spine. That's the way it looks in SMA. And it's no good getting in the water and thinking, this is great, I'm in a hot tub, I'm in the bath, I'm in a pool, I'm doing lots and lots of good, if we are just working those stronger muscles. And it's unfortunate that the stronger muscles will be the strongest and therefore work the best. And so it's always easiest to work them. So what we're going to talk a lot about today is what we're doing in the water, the best exercises in the water, not necessarily swimming, 
we're not saying everybody has to be able to swim. It's for those of you who love nothing better than to swim lengths up and down in a pool, good luck to you. But for the vast majority of us, swimming lengths in a pool has got to rank as one of the most boring activities on earth until they invent a system whereby they can play music underwater or show you videos as you swim. Because to be perfectly honest, it's a bit mind blowing once you get past 10 lengths, because all that's happening is the same thoughts are going round and round in your head about what you've forgotten to do and what you should have done. And it does get incredibly boring just swimming up and down. So yes, obviously play is our first and foremost. If you want to use the flumes, if you want to use all the wiggly watsits, if you want to go to centre parks and use all their stuff, that's absolutely fine. We love play in the water. We think plays as good as swimming, but we also have to think about how we do these things. And if we really want to exercise, we really want to lie on our back, the most important thing is that we try and keep our legs straight, not bent, not knees up, not legs outwards with our knees out this way, doing lots and lots of breaststroke style legs. We want to be doing crawl style legs, straight legs trying to kick up and down with straight legs, incredibly hard. It really isn't that easy to keep your legs straight in the water, but that's what we're trying to achieve. And if you find the child, infant, whoever you're working with cannot keep their legs straight, if it's a tiny baby, a relatively small infant, you can put their head on your shoulder and you can help them keep their legs straight just by using your arms on them. So what you've got, if I swap to a, a bigger infant, is you've got the baby on your shoulder and you are helping them keep their legs straight and you're doing lots of in and out and up and down with straight legs. In and out is a lovely exercise. Lots of splashing if they like splashing, no splashing if they don't like it, but trying to work with straight legs down in the water push down in the water, use the resistance of the water, push out in the water, pull together in the water, out, down, straighten knees, bent knees in the water and straighten them, lift your toes out of the water and you can keep their head on your shoulder and work that way. Now sometimes it's quite difficult, you can do that in the bath but you really need the bath up fairly full so that we need to think about how we do these exercises. If we're in a pool, it's quite easy. You try and find a depth where you can get to the point where the head of the child, infant is on your shoulder, even adult. And then you're helping direct. The problem is the taller the child or the adult, the much harder it is to get hold of their legs. When they get too tall for you to be able to help their legs, you have to turn them around. What you have to then do is put a neck float on of sorts and work from the feet. It's very rare to drown somebody you're working with. We have had a lot of parents have come into the pool with their child and they're holding them like this and they're holding them like this and they're trying to swim along and they've got them so close to their chest that actually the child's doing nothing. It's very, very hard to drown your child. Now, I think a lot of parents do get worried about water in the face, all sorts of things happening that is going to have a very negative effect. Children are much more robust. And as long as you don't actually leave their face in the water, they're going to be a lot better off than you think. So we need to think about neck support or trunk support. There are Plenty of little jackets you can use that doesn't stop the head falling back. There are neck pillows. For adults, one of the better pieces of equipment is this one. It really, there are children's sizes. They go behind the head and then strap under the back of the body. And most adults will say that that's a really lovely piece of flotation equipment. And if you're working in a hydro pool, hopefully they have one. 
they're not impossible to get onto the internet on the internet i can get you addresses for those but that's the sort of thing that an adult will find more comfortable often than a neck ring because they can really relax and work their legs quite well but a neck ring is a very very good piece of equipment if you can get the right size and it really does have to be the right size it's no good having something that's too big that your head falls out of and it's no good having something too small that virtually chokes you because that's not much fun in the water you can use these in the bath there is nothing to stop you using bits of floating equipment in the bath there is a proviso with baths and then we need to look at which way we start, whether we do start with pools or baths. I think probably the easiest to start with baths because more people have got a bath than a swimming pool. But even in a bath, I think we'll start there. We need to think about the fundamentals. Two things about the bath. Is there space? And secondly, if there is space, if your bath is big enough for the size of your child, are you whoever you are, parent, carer, whoever, actually in a comfortable position working with them in the water. Because one of the big issues about trying to work with a child in the bath is you getting backache from leaning over the bath. So we need to think about the person who is working with the child in the bath and make sure they're comfortable. Because as I say, it's very rare to drown a child in the bath when you're there with them, but you need to be comfortable as well and be able to help them to work. Now, one of the things that you might find in the bath that's a good way of us starting is to have something soft in the bath, some sort of mat that goes onto the bottom of the bath. It would have to suck on, you'd have to have suckers to stick it on because if it's something like a sponge or something, it's just gonna float. So you need something that's going to be quite soft in the water. A neck pillow or a neck support, neck ring is often the easiest to use in the bath because it's relatively small. Woggles are a little bit big for the bath and the little jackets are fine, but you don't really need that level of flotation just in the bath. The problem in the bath is it's actually quite a nice place to work your legs, but there isn't quite so much work room to work your arms in the bath. It's not impossible for littlies, unless you've got a reasonably big bath, not a lot of room apart from up and down, not much out and back for your arms in the bath. And that's one of the problems with a bath. It's actually finding a space for your arms to do exercise. And very often the only way you're going to get good arm exercise is to do it sitting in the bath, <coughs> excuse me, and having the water quite deep. So they're sitting, with the water up their chest and doing splashing and in and out in sitting. Not impossible. So we want to look at lying flat in the water, legs up and down. So you want to be off the bottom of the mat, straight down and up again, straight down and up, straight down and up and out to the sides and back to the middle with straight legs. Now, how do we make that more fun or how do we make that more interesting? Well, you can firstly put armbands around the ankles. That will firstly float the legs and help make it easier for them to stay off the bottom. So you've got armbands around your ankles and then you can do your ins and outs and then a bit of work to pull those armbands down in the water. Now that's hard work. And it's very easy then to just pull on your strong knee muscles. So if that's what's happening, you've got your armband around your ankle and all that's happening is that they're bending their knees, then what you should be doing is letting some of the air out so they're not quite as strongly inflated and then it'll be easier to pull the whole leg down in the water. So you can use the amount of inflation in armbands to assist or resist, make it harder or not so hard. But when they're, they're quite well inflated, it's a nice position to keep the legs on the top of the water and do lots of ins and outs. And they can splash and they can 
catch things in between their legs. They can stop you pulling their legs apart. They can hold on to a ball, a floating ball in between their legs. So there's things that can be done in their legs. You can put a ball on the top of the water and they can try and kick it. You can do bubbles and they have to lift their legs out of the water as straight as possible to try and get the bubbles. There are, you've got to be, have your imagination to play these games. Now you can do these in the hot tub as well, and play pretty much all the same things in the hot tub. But the most important thing is, as I said, that we're not just working these hip flexors. Marnie, have we got any questions yet? We've got a couple. Um, okay, let's got, take some questions. We've got someone asking if there should be in a pool a minimum or a maximum temperature. They're worried that their local pool might be too cold. Okay, now a lot of people complain that the water is too cold. A hydrotherapy pool is usually between 31 and 33 degrees. Public pools are not a lot colder. They're usually between 27 and 31. If you are worried about the pool being cold, then you need to put more clothes on. And as daft as that sounds, you can get little wetsuits. You can get the all-in-one bodysuits. Now, there's two types of all-in-one bodysuit. There's the Australian-style sunsuit that's supposed to protect you from the sun, from the ultraviolet, or you can get the suits, a lot of all-in-one body suits for swimming now that you will find that some of the religious groups use to cover themselves in the water. So there is absolutely no shortage of full body suits available on the internet, not expensive. There is nothing to say that a little boy has to just wear a pair of swim trunks and a little girl has to wear a little bikini or a little swimsuit and get cold. Basically put more clothes on. Now a wetsuit is, sounds like a good idea because they do float a little bit, but they are an absolute sod to get on and a double sod to get off. So while it sounds like a nice idea, a wetsuit as such is impossible, but what you can get is separate top and trousers. So you can get the sort of little wetsuit tops, particularly to keep your top half warm because those are the bits that tend to get the coldest, your body and your arms. So there's nothing, as I say, to say, people seem to have this idea that you have to be undressed. You have to be in swim trunks or swim shorts. Swim shorts actually get in the way. They very often get air in them that floats in strange places. Makes you think you've um, done your own bubbles. But swim shorts are not necessarily the best. But there are, as I say, sun suits and all sorts of little water suits that you can get now that will keep you warm. So you don't have to. There is no rules about what you can wear in the water. Obviously, you can't wear your shoes and socks and a pair of jeans. Not terribly helpful. But all these little extra suits to keep kids warm are available on the Internet. Marnie? OK. Um, are ankle and wrist weights good to use during exercise in the pool? I'm not sure that I would call them weights. I do think you might find that the children sink if they've got weights. It's not actually weights. You can use floats and there are special loads and loads of swimming equipment and there are special floats and rings you can use around your arms and legs. Now, unless you are a competent swimmer, I would not be using weights. Now, what you can use for resistance for your feet are flippers. They actually are supposed to make swimming easier, but believe it or not, they can make it a lot harder to do exercises. So if any of you have ever worn flippers, they're great if you can swim, but they are good for doing a bit of um, resistance work. And the other thing you can get is hand paddles, loads and loads of hand paddles. Now, hand paddles have two functions. The children who find that they can't keep their fingers together and, and therefore cannot swim or cannot do the exercise because they, they're not strong enough to keep their hands together to push the water aside, hand paddles work really nicely. Now the special gloves that you can get that are like hand paddles or just hand paddles that have got elastic that you can put your hands into. So hand paddles are a really nice way of doing exercise, but I'm not sure that I would use weights. I'm not sure that I have ever used weights actually around an ankle. I have used um, floats 
around ankles. And I, the other thing that you can use, really good for resistance, is a knotted woggle. So you get your woggle and you make it into a knot and you can use that for arm and leg exercises. So woggles are available in most swim shops, in most sports shops, they're really not expensive. Um, so if you want a good piece of equipment, you can get a woggle because not only can you use it for a float around your middle, but as I say, you can tie it in a knot and use it to exercise with. Okay, I'll just say, just in case there's anyone from America watching who might not know what a woggle is, it's a pool noodle. Is oh, that right. sort of what is that what it's called in America? <laughs> That's what we call them, yeah. Um, oh, a pool noodle. Okay. Yeah. Um, are there benefits of having like a jacuzzi style bath rather than a normal style bath? No, basically. Um, unless you have the jets and you are working against the resistance of a jet, the bubbles themselves feel nice but they're not actually doing something. The jets are more massaging than actually just bubbles. Um, and you can try and work against the jets if they're not too strong. So you can work against some jets. They can be a little bit too strong, but most bath jets aren't strong. But it's not the bubbles, it's not the swirling water because you can do your own swirling of the water and set up the resistance. If you move your hands out and then pull your hands back together, you're doing enough swirling of the water. You don't need a jacuzzi bath to do it. As I say, the bubbles are very, very nice, but no, they don't make a difference. They just feel lovely. And if the jets are very, very gentle, then they're not gonna do anything. And if they're very strong, they're gonna be too strong to work again. So if you can control the jets and make it a nice level, so that you're putting your hand against the jet and trying to stop the jet from pushing your hand, putting your leg by the jet and stopping it from pushing you. Yes, that sort of resistance is really nice, but it's only really with the jets. Now, I don't think that the sort of bath mat style jacuzzi so that you just lay in the bath actually will have jets. They're just bubble mats. Um, some of the, you really need a fairly big jacuzzi bath to get a decent jet. Some of the hot tubs have jets and that's possibly worth it if you were thinking of getting them, but actually just bubbles, it feels very nice. Some people don't like the bubbles. Most people like the bubbles. That's why they like the jacuzzis, um, but they feel nice. They're not actually um, doing the work unless they've got uh, a jet with them. Okay. Um... Sorry, I'm just finding it. Right. Okay. Um, is it worth using the shallow end of the pool to almost walk in and get that walk? In? Absolutely. Well, one of the nice things about the shallow end of a pool is that as a parent, you can sit in it. And then when you're sitting down, there's an awful lot you can do with the child. And actually it makes you quite stable, particularly with a small child. So if you are sitting in the shallow end so that the water is coming up to your shoulders when you're sitting, and if you're a bit of a midget like me, then that's you don't have to be in very deep to actually get the water to quite a nice height. And then you can do, as I say, you've got the baby here or infant here on your shoulders. Even with a bigger child, it gives you a bit of control and you can be sitting in the water. I know in our hydrotherapy pool, we're, we, we've got two levels. And when I'm in the deeper part, my feet just about touch the floor and leave my head out of the water. So I find it quite difficult to work with a bigger child. When I'm in the deeper part, I have to be in the shallower part, but it is quite nice to sit. And a lot of the hydrotherapy pools do have a, an area where the physio can sit to work. And that actually give, feel, makes you feel much more stable. So if you can sit in the shallow end, you can do some sitting. Certainly, obviously, in the shallow end, when you're talking about walking in the shallow end, that will depend how tall you are. Because really, when you want to walk in the water, you want to walk almost at chest height, very often what we call nipple height. And again, strangely enough, there are good ways and bad ways to walk in the water, would you believe? We do a lot of what we call racing in the water, if you can stand um, and if you can take some steps. 
and actually racing forwards in the water, walking forwards in the water, again, is working these hip flexor muscles. So we very much like walking backwards in the water because then you're using those muscles of your bum. So we do walking backwards in the water, which is not as hard as it sounds, and walking sideways in the water is something else that we recommend, but not lots of racing forwards because again, what you end up doing is using your hip flexor muscles. Now, another way of racing in the water that's really quite nice is to put the woggle between your legs as though you're sitting on a horse. So you've got the woggle between your legs. So it's a bit like if I can take this and you hold the woggle in your hands at the front. So if I show you with this, if it'll work, it may not. I don't have a... Um, an Ike size woggle, but that's the idea. So you've got it between your legs and you're holding on to it and it's sticking out of the water at the back so that it's holding you up underneath. And then what you can do is you can have races in the water like that, kicking your legs backwards and racing through the water on a woggle. And that's quite a nice way of having a race or a play. So that's what makes the, the woggles or pool noodles so versatile there's an awful lot you can do with them um, obviously you can float on them you can float on your back on them you can have them around your neck you can have them around your legs you can tie them in a knot around your legs and you can have them knotted and do exercises with your arms and if you can stand in the water or if you can stand and hold on to something in the water and you're holding a knotted noodle then you can do pulling down in the water, pulling across the front of you in the water, swishing it round in the water. Some people can stand without holding on. That's not very often. Most people can't, but you can keep yourself vertical and hold on and then do exercise in the water that way with the noodle or woggle on your hands. But you can do the same with the floats. And again, if you've got floats around your ankle, it's pretty hard to stand up with floats around your ankle, would you believe? And again, then you can do the races where you're going backwards and you're going sideways. And the reason I've left this little heart on here is so that you can see which is the front and which is the back. So I think I'm going to be leaving little hearts. I should possibly put eyes, but we're for now we'll put little hearts so that you can see which is the front of my little Ike here. I've got two now, so I suppose I should call something something else. Ike and Tiger, because the other one came from Tiger. We're getting um, quite a lot of questions regarding bats. Right. Um, this is like a really popular topic. Um, you mentioned about using the um, armbands as legs, um, but someone's asked, um, her, the, her eight year old daughter can fully stretch out in the bath. She wears a neck float, so she's looking for exercises to help with her stiff legs. Is there anything else she could do? It depends what you say by stiff. Are we talking about that they don't move a lot or are we talking about contractures? Now you can do stretches in the bath and it's a really nice to, place to do stretches. And one of the reasons it's such a nice place to do stretches is because the warm water obviously relaxes your joints. And what you're doing is pretty similar to what you would be doing out of the water. So if you want to stretch hip flexors, knees, what you would get them to do is pushing. So you've got a bent up knee and push. Now I know that they might not be able to push completely straight, but if they're lying on their back, even if their legs out sideways and bent in the water, if they can try, you bend their leg up and push it straight, bend their leg up, push it straight, bend it up, push it straight. One thing you don't want to do is point your toe when you're doing that. So as they're pushing down, the idea would be that you're pushing down, but you're pulling your foot upwards. So you bend and you push, bend up, push down and you could be pushing against something in the water you could be pushing against a sponge you could be pushing against a toy in the water you could be pushing against somebody's hand 
or the cat if the cat will stay there. Um, I know the dog in our house won't stay in the bath, not unless you put peanut butter all around the walls. Um, but there's things you can do. You can get things that can squeeze, things that can light up. Eight years old, put some music on. Put some music on, get a TikTok on. You could do all the exercises that you're doing standing up and sitting down. You could be doing in the bath. Have a look and see what it says. But there's no reason why you shouldn't have the music on in the bathroom. Get Spotify on or Amazon Music and have a little bit of a dance in the water too. That might be nice for an eight-year-old to do a bit of water babies. They could, they could, she could always assume she was a um, synchronized swimmer without the rest of the team. Do a little bit of ballet and dance through the water. Yeah, we've got there you are. She could make up her own, she could make up her own synchronized swimming routine. Perfect. She'll just have to find the other kids to do it with. Yeah. We could also set up a TikTok challenge. Obviously, don't film your child in the bath, but you could say we're doing a TikTok challenge. That's yeah, really or as I say, you could set up your own synchronized swimming team over the internet. You could have a Zoom synchronized swimming team. Yes. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, we've got another one saying Hydro is out of action since March and do not feel safe going to public pools. Um, if we don't have hot tub, what could I do in a deep bath for my 12 year old as it's pretty tight from the waist down? understandably now one of the things that people forget but it is pretty tight maybe when you're lying on your back but if you can get a neck pillow so that you're out of the water there's nothing actually to stop your 12 year old turning onto their side so their head's out of the water if the if the, if the bath's fairly deep get them on their side get their head supported so their head's not going down you could work the top leg up and down, backwards and forwards, and then swap sides and go back the other way. So although we think that, yes, it's a bit tight when you're lying on your back, it might not be quite so tight if you can get on your side. Now, this is one situation where you might find that you want a mat in the bottom of the bath because it may not be quite so comfortable to lie on your side, on your hip bones, or on your waist or on your ribs in the bath on your side. It's always nicer when you've got a bit of padded bum on the bottom of the bath. But this is where one of those nice squishy mats, almost like the shower mats that, are, that stick themselves to the bottom of the bath, the non-slip mats, perfectly all right. You don't need anything expensive. Just a non-slip mat tends to be softer. And then lie on your side and do exercises with your top leg and top arm on your side. It still might not give you a lot of room, but it's probably gonna give you more room than when you're lying on your back. Yeah. Um, sorry, I've lost my place um, Any form of resistance I can create in a bathtub laying down or sitting up. I have two children with SMA, one likes a neck ring and the other sits in a supportive upright seat. Any fun exercises in the water which I can bring up to the chest? There is, everything that you're moving in the water produces resistance but any toys that you can think of. Now one of the things that you can do with arms is a lot of the pouring games. So the child that likes to sit can do a lot of work by taking toys from the bottom of the water, scooping water, carrying water and pouring. So if you've got one of those toys on the side of the bath where like the water wheels and things that you can lift the water from the bottom of the bath, great exercise for the arms is lifting a cup or tea set for little children. Lovely to play with a tea set in the water. There's loads of arm exercises you can do with a tea set in the water. Um, that's one of the things that you can be doing in terms of resistance. As I say, you can put um, armbands around their wrists. It doesn't have to be up by their shoulders. It can be around their wrists. That'll give them resistance in and out, up and down. 
You can't actually add weights in the water, but there are other things that you can do. There are weighted toys that you can try putting on the bottom of the bath and getting them to lift them out. That's another one that they can do. So there are weighted toys. You may be able to just go into your own toy cupboard and find weights that'll sink to the bottom of the bath, toys or weights that they then have to lift and put onto different heights. So you may lift, hold a box or a cup and get them to put these weighted toys into a cup or into a bowl or throw them out of the side of the bath. They can do the same with their feet. They can try and pick things up with their toes out of the water. It's another way of doing exercise in resistance if they like we're lying on their back. They can try and lift something out of the water that's sitting on their foot that you can lift your foot up in the air. Um, I seem to have an unhappy dog at the moment. Let me just open the door, see if he's an even unhappier dog when I let him in. Sit down. Let's see what he gets up to. Noisy animal. Oh, hello, what's he found? So that you can, you've got to just go through all the things that wouldn't spoil by being put in the water. Little bits of Lego. You may find that what happens is you can pick them up with your toes. You can try building up a tower of Lego in the bath. Do clothes. Just have a look through the toy box. See what you can get. Have a look at the bath toys. See what you can put in the bath toys. There are the letters and things that you can stick on the wall. You can be lying down and stick them on the side of the bath. You can stick things on the side of the bath and then you can get their feet and get them to move things along the bath with their feet. So you've got these letters that stick on the side of the bath that you could push backwards and forwards with their feet. Excuse me, he wants to go out again. Come on, you, get out. You wanna go out, go out. No, change your mind. Oh, God, bloody dogs. Sit there. Okay, changed his mind again. Yeah. So, you, like with all exercise, you just have to use a bit of imagination. The other thing is you have to think in terms of fatigue. This is something people forget about with swimming and exercise in water. It's quite easy to forget about fatigue when you're swimming or in the bath. A bath can be quite tiring for someone with SMA. So if you're working in the bath as well, don't start off doing 20, 25 minutes. Start off 10 minutes and build it up. Otherwise, you're going to have a very floppy child when you get out if you overdo it. People forget that this is a lot of exercise. Now, what I do have is this. It's what we call a fried egg. And for anybody who's happy either standing in the water or working in the water, but doesn't like their face near the water, we love the fried eggs. And we have races with a whole set of fried eggs. And what happens is, and the reason that they're two colors, they float on the water. And if you get your mouth down, and blow, it will flip over to the other side and it flips. And it's a way of introducing small children to getting their face nearer the water. And they're really lovely, they float, they float. But they also can be quite nice for games, for lifting them out of the water with your feet, for swishing them around the water, for throwing them around the water, for skimming them along the water. So those are the fried eggs really quite like those they're quite robust and you can get different colors so that you can have races and games with those and they are small enough to go in the bath obviously okay great we've got one saying i'm an adult and i'm hoisted into the bath we did have a hot tub but the outdoor hoist needs to be sorted because it's run its course is there anything i can do in this like Yes, the first thing is don't get completely in the water first, dangle. Not after you get out, we're not talking about drip dry because you'll get cold, but before you actually get in, as long as you've got a warm bathroom and then do some work just above the level of the water. So your legs are in the water, but you're not. So that you're sitting in the sling and you're doing some swishing with your legs in the water, swishing, swishing out to the side so that you're above the level of the water 
but you're exercising your legs because once you're sat in the bath, obviously you don't have the room to move your legs around. But if you can hoist, then if you're not quite in the water, you're above it, that gives you more space to actually do your legs. And the lady who had the 12 year old, again, that said it was a bit of a tight fit, if he's hoisted and can stay above the level of the water, he might get some nice leg exercise by having a bit of work in the water, by swishing his legs round and round and up and down before he actually gets in. So that's one thing that you can do. The other thing that you can do is actually not hoist so that you're sitting in the bath and you can actually do a bit of trunk work in the sling. You can try swinging so that depending on, on, your, on the, the shape of your sling, if you have a little bit of flexibility, you can try swimming backwards and forwards with your bum in the sling, sort of almost floating on the water and get some nice trunk muscle work to swish yourself backwards and forwards across the water. So you're using the hoist as a swing to get a little bit of work and swing across the top of the water. Now that might not work depending on how your hoist works and how your sling works, but if you have the room, see if you can get yourself swinging, swinging backwards and forwards and side to side in the water. It's quite a nice way of getting that trunk and that back moving. Unless of course you've had, you're solid with spinal surgery, but you can still use a bit of movement to try and have a bit of a swish and a splash that way. Okay, we've got one that um, could probably lead on from that, and it's about staying in a sling in the hot tub. Um, and could you exercise in that way too? Well, you can never really get into lying in a sling. That's the only thing. The question is, are you ever going to get stretched out? If you're sitting in the sling, you're only really going to get probably that far back. And there are times when you really want to try and get yourself stretched out and get a good old hip stretch in the water. And that's one of the beauties of being in the water is having that opportunity that you don't have, say, when you're lying in bed, to actually get that little bit of extra movement at the hips, that bit of extension, that bit of work to actually get those legs down when they're relaxed, when they're warm and get them moving in a way that, yeah, you know, if you're in a sling, somebody's moving your legs around, that's absolutely fine. But the beauty of the water is that you can do so much more yourself. So if you're sitting in the sling and the sling is going to be restrictive, then you're not going to be able to do the level of exercise that you can do normally. Sorry, the dog's now snoring on the floor. Oh, I've the, the, um, <laughs> <laughs> never heard a cat snore. Um, the, what, you, what people have got to remember is what is the beauty of the water? The water takes the weight of your body and allows you to move. It's like working with slings, like working with the TheraBand that takes the weight of the body and allows you to move your muscles much, much more than you do on dry land. So if you're in the bath or in the hot tub and the sling is taking all of your weight, can you do the work? Can you, are your legs free enough? Can you get enough extension? Can you get yourself as flat as possible if you stay in the sling? Now, I understand why it's useful to stay in the sling, but you really want to try and get it so that you can stretch out and get your legs exercising, if possible, as straight as they will go. Um, the other thing is that slings very often restrict the amount that you can move your arms. So just make sure if you've got that, it may even be that you will find that um, some of the other slings are more flexible. Uh, some of the standing slings, even a toilet sling is not quite as big. And it may be that you just need to look at using a different type of sling to get you in and out of the hot tub to give you a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more movement in the water. It's absolutely fine if you're not restricted, but if you're very restricted, it may be that you want to look at a different type of sling. Okay, great. Um, I've lost my place again. I'm a nightmare tonight, aren't I? Um, 
I have a hot tub. I have found ankle floats and knee floats, which Velcro around the ankle and knee. I'm trying to get my little girl to push her legs down as if she's standing against the water, but she's finding it very difficult. Any advice? What you may be able to do, and this is um, if you have an old pair of leg splints, be it gaiters, an old pair of cafos, um, it may be better to actually wear splints in the water. We have in the past actually made casts for people to stand in the water. And what we've done, um, and you might be able to get your physio to do it with any luck, it would be a nice thing to do. I certainly wouldn't mind doing it for any of our kids is to make them a pair of scotch cast splints just to tie on in the water, because obviously you can't use plaster of Paris. They'll just dissolve in the water, but you could use the fiberglass material and just have two cylinders. Yes, the inside will get soggy, but you can dry them off and tie them on in the water to help you stand up. The alternative is to get some very clever daddy or grandpa or uncle to get, and I have heard of this being done quite successfully, guttering. Yep, I actually mean guttering. And you get the right size piece of guttering. If it's a bit, the plastic, if it's a little bit hard, you could get something to line it with, tie it on with a bandage and use a piece of guttering. And I have heard of that being used. So you just need to use a little bit of imagination. Granddad chopped the guttering to the right length, got a piece of gutter. In fact, I think he used um, something, whatever he used, and they used guttering to stand up in the pool. So off you go to Wix, get a little bit of guttering, probably doesn't have to be much, uh, line it with something nice and soft, make sure the edges aren't sharp. Granddad, get a sander on them or put some padding on them and bandage them on and stand in the water in splints, you might find it easier. But we've definitely made splints. We've had kids who've used old splints, the problem with gaiters in the water, they will dry out. But if you're not, I um, don't think the metal goes rusty. But if you do find it goes rusty, we may be in trouble. If the metal struts, some, it depends on the company that makes them. Some of the metal struts won't rust, some might. Okay, okay, we've got one. Um, um, how can we stimulate movement? by our 17 month old type one whilst in the bath. He's got, they've got no head control and they hold him beneath his neck to keep him above the water. You're not going to get their head control in the water. It's not really the place you're going to be able to get it. And the trouble is if you are holding the head, it's very, very difficult for them to work it by themselves. The pool is not the easiest place. A bath is not the easiest place to do it because you really need to be behind them. You need to be in a situation where you can give them the minimal support and try and get them to let go. Now, the other way that you can do this, and this is what we do in the pool, in our hydro pool with the type ones, and you'd be surprised how useful this can be, is to put them on their tummy and to hold them on their tummy. Now everybody assumes that you can only put them on their back but if you've got them under the chin then you can try and get them to hold their head up there as well and again get them doing some work of turning their head. You don't want them in the water but you do want to be able to do that where they're trying to keep their head out the water. You can put them on their side don't forget, people very often forget about the side. You can have them on your arm, not quite so easy. Depending on how big a 17 month old and how big a bath, it may be easier if you are in the bath together so that you're in the bath. Now, if, and it's really lovely with a small child, probably under two years old for the two of you to be in the bath together, but you need another adult to lift the child in and out of the bath. You should not be in the bath lifting the child in and out. So if you get in the bath, is it mummy or daddy makes no difference, grandma, whoever, you're in the bath, they lift the child in the bath to you and you're holding them. 
and then you can lift them out to somebody but never ever be the one in the bath with the child on your own because that's really hard to get out okay there is nothing to stop you doing sideways and getting them to move their head backwards and forwards in the water people tend to forget sideways getting them to roll in the water so you're on your side and they're rolling onto their back is a nice way of getting some control and some movement you can assist them in rolling nice in the water some parents will say their children don't like water in their ears then try and get a little ear plug if you can to try and stop them getting water in their ears obviously you have a hand under their head to stop their head falling but then you're turning and getting them to roll and roll a nice place to roll you've got a hand under their bottom under their trunk and you're helping them to roll so they can even roll forward roll back and do it on the other side swap sides do it and as i say don't forget to work them on their tummy supporting their chin quite nice to have them in the water that way as well and then you can if you're in a hot tub or in a pool then you can work face to face now the other thing i like to do in a pool if you've got a pool and a hot tub is to sit them and i it's actually really easy particularly the small children type one and type two it's type one you're holding their head is to actually sit them on your hand in the water and people forget this one it's a really lovely exercise don't think we can see very much they're actually sitting on your hand if they don't have head control then you need to hold their head as well but it's such a lovely exercise for those who've got head control you can be moving them in the water they're using their trunk they're actually using their butt muscles this is one position in a hot tub or in a swimming pool that the children are really working hard it's good fun you can play games like this you've got a lot more control than you think as long as you have a hand in front a hand under their bottom you're well supported you're not wobbly then it's a really lovely thing to do is to sit them on your hand and be make them work in that position not one for the bath of course because unless you've got an incredibly deep bath and plenty of space you're not going to do it but don't forget tummies do not forget tummies and get them working on their tummy as well even if their hands are on the bottom of the bath that is not a bad place to be so that they get their hands on the bottom of the bath keep their head out of the water hands on the bottom of the bath hands hanging down you can even do a little bit of crawling movement in the water and get them working that way get them working their back muscles get them working their bottom get them working on their tummies people really forget they think that they go the kids are going to hate it there's going to be problems they're going to get a face full of water if you're gentle and you're careful they don't and we've actually had quite a lot of success from some of the type ones getting movement of their head that they never ever get in another position out of the water or somewhere else so you would be surprised, be a, be a little bit adventurous. Don't keep thinking you're going to drown them or cover them in water or make them paranoid and will never want to go in the water again. As long as you are confident, as long as you know where your hands are, and particularly in a hot tub or but hot tub, you're often sitting down, which is lovely, really makes you well anchored. So a hot tub is really lovely and even easier for most people than a swimming pool for littlies because you can be sitting, you've got lots and lots of control, getting them doing, getting their little uh, eggs, fried eggs, getting toys, getting things floating on the water, getting things, boats to push, all sorts of things that you can do with children on their tummies. Don't forget tummies. Don't forget tummies in the water. We're not expecting them to put their head down and lift them up again but also it does get them used to having their face close to the water. Sorry, got a puppy dog down here. No, I'm not giving you a tummy rub right now. Needy puppy. <laughs> um, we've got another one that kind of links to that previous question, which is how can I safely do work 
on the stomach with my child in the bath with their head above the water and then any advice? The problem with the bath is when you're not in there, um, you've got to lean over quite a lot. If it's a bigger child, there's not much room. I accept that for big kids, it doesn't work. The most important is to have your hand supporting or the neck ring on that way round. But if you have the neck ring, if they're happy to have the neck ring on so that it's this way round, or if you can get your hand under their head, there is no reason why you can't do it in the bath. Obviously, there isn't as much room. It's much more of a strain on your back to actually do that but it really is a nice position. And again, it stretches the hips, it gets the knees out, it gets the back working, which doesn't happen normally. So it is quite a nice position. I know mean, a lot of the kids, once you get to swim, the kids are quite happy to swim on their fronts, particularly those that swim under the water. When, they, when you swim under the water, you don't swim on the, under the water on your back. You always swim, which is a strange thing if you think about it. You're happy on top of the water swimming on your back and doing backstroke. Once you learn to go under the water, you don't do backstroke under the water. You always go forwards because if you do backstroke under the water, you'll get water all over the place. So it's actually easier on your tummy to go swim under the water. When you think about it, the only backstroke is on your back. It's the only way you can swim on your back. Your swimming generally is on your front. That's how you propel yourself. So if you want to get the child to learn to swim, you really do need to think about them getting into that position. I was on mute then, sorry. Okay. Um, we've got another one saying, my feet naturally point down in the water and I'm not strong enough to encourage them to lift up. What can I do to get a nice foot position in the bath if I'm sitting as it's very uncomfortable against the bottom of the bath? You could put splints on your feet. That is a possibility. Um, you could pad the bath. You could have it so that there was you could get a lump of foam, of chip foam, and put it against the bath. You could have chip foam or high density foam. You know what chip foam is. It's the one with all the little bits glued together. It doesn't float as well as a normal foam. So if you really have your feet are uncomfortable in the bath, you can get some chip foam and get it I cut into a sort of little step so that your heels are on it and your feet are against it to actually pad up the bath and make it more comfortable for you. So think about some chip foam, um, Dunelm sell foam, and I think they might sell chip foam. They definitely sell foam, so you really need a high density foam, not a very spongy foam. But if you can get a high density foam and make, as I say, a little step out of it, um, to put your heels on to make them more comfortable and to prop your feet up is another way of doing it if you don't want to wear a pair of foot splints in the bath which will also <laughs> rust around the rivets by the way um this is more like a statement rather than a question but it's really cool is that i have a small basketball ring suctioned to the wall on one end of the bath my son loves throwing sponges through it then it's got better and better if I want the sponges heavier for him, I leave it soaked with water. This is true, but you, again, you can use a high density foam that uh, is heavier. You can also use uh, balls and actually get balls, heavier balls. Um, I found out quite recently that the people who make the TheraBand also make these therapy balls and you can get weighted balls that come in different weights. You can use different weight balls in the bath. There's nothing to stop you using a, a normal ball that you would use, um, that you could possibly use in the bath. Okay. Um, last question, and then you can go give them a big belly rub, is um, a woman says that her son loves swimming, but she's worried he's only really exercising his elbow and forearm when swimming and he's not really moving his shoulders what can she do to encourage him to use his shoulders more that depends on where we're talking about if we're talking about swimming in a pool 
or in the hot tub, the main thing to do is to actually help them move their shoulders and get them to um, do more stuff. So what you end up with is that you are helping them by actually getting them to move their arms in the water. So you are there with them and actually encouraging that shoulder movement. Now, again, you can do it in, on the side, you can do it in the front. And actually one of the places that you will get more shoulder movement is on your front than on your back. Because when you're on your back, you can actually get away with doing less. It's harder when you're on your front to get away without doing a lot of shoulder movement. So you can do elbow and hand, but you actually need more shoulders on your front. So if you can get them on their front, but also be there, as I say, you can work on, in the, on the side. Shh. Sorry, painful dog tonight. Work on their side and get them doing games and exercises in side lying as well to get them in the water. Oh, yeah. oh dear, sorry. It's okay, Lucy has pointed out that your dog started barking when you said the word fall. <laughs> possibly, possibly. Uh, I was about to say he hasn't got any himself. Um, he's not, he chews them. Uh, he's he's a bit of a terrorist with balls. Oh really? But uh, no, I I normally have a dog sitter when I'm doing the webinars, but I don't have one tonight to entertain him. That's why he's getting a little bit fractious. Do you know what? I'm surprised that of all of these webinars, we haven't had one of our two coming in and wanting attention. There must be a like my mum and dad must be keeping them anyway. well that's that's normally my son is here and entertains the dog but he's actually gone out tonight so the dog's been yeah. a total pest <laughs> i did take him for a long walk beforehand thinking he might sleep but of course not oh no they never sleep when you need them to. no never no well as far as i can see that's it for questions okay let's have a, a look more at hot tubs um, I know a lot of people are starting to put their hot tubs away. Um, they get a little bit expensive at this time of year. One of the things I'm particularly concerned about with hot tubs, and one lady was talking about having a sling into the hot tub, is getting in and out. And when you are planning a hot tub, I hope you are planning to think about how you are getting people in and out of these hot tubs. Because if you don't have a hoist, then really it is a problem. So once you are, as long as, you know, I'm quite happy as everybody knows when my parents come to Great Ormond Street to tell them off if they're not looking after their own backs because very often they're not. And lifting in and out of the water is not easy. And I know a lot of people who go in hot tubs, particularly adults, are not always sober when they get out the pool, because obviously there's not only do we get in the hot tub and have a good old swim, but we often have a glass of something when we're in there as well. Not the kids, hopefully, but you do need to take care in a hot tub. I think uh, lifting people in and out is a big problem. But one of the things that we need to think about in the hot tub is trying to get vertical. And people say, how big should they be? How deep should they be? And I have no concept of your garden, your needs, your family. You have to go for the hot tub that not only works for you in terms of physical space, but also financially, because obviously the bigger they are, the more expensive they are. And not only that, but the bigger they are, the bit more they cost to heat. So that is a consideration. But if the child can stand, if they can swim, even if it's just a couple of strokes, then obviously that is ideal. But if they can't swim, if they can do some verticaling, vertic what the, the Americans call verticalization, that they can get upright, even if they have to be held upright, 
it is a really nice position to be able to get into in a hot tub because a lot of people hate being in their standing frame. And even if they're in a standing frame, it's very passive. They're not getting up too much. So to be able to get into a, a hot tub and get into a vertical position, even if you have to be held there, it's so much easier to hold a child up in the water. If you're sitting down, you're hardly taking the weight because the water's taking a lot of the weight and then they can move their trunk, they can move their hips, they can move their legs. And it's really lovely to be vertical and the same in a swimming pool. Now, I know a lot of people are saying that they're worried about going to pools. And I know a lot of people don't like to go to a pool in the winter anyway. And I know that going to a pool, unless you're really a committed swimmer or you're going with school or you go to a club, you know, by the time you drive to a pool, you get out, you get changed, you get in the water, you have half an hour. For a half hour swim, it takes three hours. And that's one of the big issues. It really is a palaver. And actually getting out and getting dry and getting out into the cold at this time of year is no fun. I know there are people who are swimming. I know there are some very keen swimmers and that's great. And they will continue to go. There is no real danger in the pools. I think most of the pools, you have to book a slot. You can't just turn up and jump in the water because they are also keeping people distanced in the water so that they are not packed. Check out your local pool if you are a keen swimmer and you want to get back in the water. Because as I say, you cannot catch COVID from the water. So unless you were in a packed changing room, then I'll have one Ian, please. <laughs> so unless you're in a packed changing room, um, you're, you're not in danger. And if you have a private changing room or a special place to change, then there really is no danger. There's, it's no worse than going to a shopping center or a pub. You are not in closer proximity in a pool. If your pool is arranging your swimming by appointment and they are limiting the numbers. So check your local pool, because I think one of the big issues with lockdown has been the stopping swimming. Now, hydro is another area altogether. And parents will often say to a physio and particularly us at neuromuscular services, will you write and say my child has to have hydro? I can't write to a service and say your child has to have hydro if they don't have a hydrotherapy pool or if there isn't a hydrotherapy pool in the area. So it's no good saying your child must have hydrotherapy. This is why we need hot tubs, we need baths, we need to think about whether we can get into a pool or a warm pool. And we used to have the most fab pool and it's still there in West London, Durnell, because the children's pool was amazing. It was a walk-in pool, it was enormous. It was shallow for a lot of the pool. And to be perfectly honest, I loved going there. I loved taking the kids there. It was quite a long way from us, uh, but it was worth the extra journey to get there. And if there was one thing I insisted when my kids were little that they learned to swim. And I think if you have siblings who swim, if you go on holiday, one of the best things you can ensure is that your child learns to swim. And the children are good swimmers when they learn to swim. It's not important to do lengths. More important than actually being able to swim lengths is just have confidence in the pool, be happy in the water, enjoy being in there because it is good exercise. Now, as I say, it is non-weight bearing exercise. Adults, it is the best exercise you can do, more so even than children, because once you start getting adults, you've got stiff joints, you've got a fixed spine, then you are in a position where you can exercise in so many ways that you cannot exercise on dry land. You have freedom of movement. The water takes the weight of your body. You can move in ways that you can't move out of the water. So actually, while it's lovely for children, it's even better exercise for adults because many, many adults do not get the opportunity to move in the way they do in the water. Children come out of their chairs, they do sport, they do activity, they do physiotherapy. You expect children to get on with it. Adults, about time you got out of your chairs and got into the water. And I know a lot of you will say you don't like being in the water, you don't like swimming. But I think we need to make a push. 
yes, there's COVID, yes, there's difficulties, but if you can get in the water and enjoy it, if you can find somewhere that's warm, I know hydro is a big issue. There are hospices, there are not many adult hospices, there are pools at schools, but they're very rarely open to the public. But if there are pools that are available, a lot of the private schools have their own pools that are open to the public at other times. If you contact some of the hotels that have got pools and leisure centers, very often they will let you have off peak times when they're very quiet, particularly the hotels now, if their spas are open, um, they're desperate for business. So, Look at your local hotel that has a spa. If the pool is open, see if you can get in there. If the pool's not open, so much the better. They may let you have a private swim if they're keeping it heated. Depends whether it's actually filled with water or not. But adults, to be honest, you have no better opportunity than swimming to do some exercise. It is so much easier in the water, so much more comfortable in the water if you have pain then you're gonna be better off in the warm water. It is soothing, it is relaxing, and it helps to get your joints moving. So don't think this is just about children. This is about adults too. This is about getting you some exercise. This is about you getting working. And particularly for those of you who are starting with Spin Rasa or hoping to start with Spin Rasa or hoping to get onto Ristiplam, then think about how you are gonna up your exercise to make these drugs as effective as possible. Marnie, any questions? Um, I'm saying, are they like, you know, like the inflatable um, hot tubs that you can tend to get from like Aldi and things like that, are they as good as traditional hot tubs or? Well, well it's funny you should say that, but I, did know of a family who used a birthing pool for their little boy. Um, it was quite big. I saw it in action. They'd got it second hand. They'd got this birthing pool and he used to swim in it every day. And there was plenty of room for him to have a swim and a move around in the water. So I'm sure the inflatable hot tubs are no different from this birthing pool. And in fact, I should think that actually that's probably pretty much what they are very similar to this birthing pool. And certainly for smaller children, that sounds fine. I can't see why there would be a problem. My only issue with an inflatable one is how easy it is to get in and out, particularly for an adult. But again, if you have two adults and a child with SMA, as long as one adult is in the water and passing the child in, if you don't have any way of hoisting them in, then that is probably the safest way. So to me, the big issue about the inflatable ones is not um, how safe they are in the water. Because as with anything, if you are at the side of the pool all the time with the child or in the water with the child, there shouldn't be any safety issues. The difficulties are getting in and out. Now, how an adult manages with these inflatable ones, I don't know, because one of the things about a lot of adults in hot tubs is they sit on the edge and slide into the water. And I don't think you could do that in an inflatable one. because They don't tend to have very secure sides. So do make sure that getting in and getting out is going to be suitable way of, uh, that's where the safety issues obviously come in. Okay, um, someone else has asked if we do get a home hot tub or a little pool, um, do they have to be careful of any chemicals on the child's lungs? They, there are standard chemicals that are the same for hot tubs as usually for swimming pools and hydrotherapy pools. Now, hydrotherapy pools and hot tubs, because they are warmer, do very often have a higher level of chemicals because obviously the bugs can live in the warmer water and multiply. Now, what you need to do is check twofold. Firstly, have a look at the chemicals that are recommended for that hot tub. Um, and get advice from either an infection control nurse from your hospital and speak to them um, about the chemicals that they're using or there may be an expert in those sort of pool chemicals 
um, from a hydrotherapy center. But generally, the, the chemicals that they use for a hot tub are not going to be different from a hydrotherapy pool. So I can't see that there would be an issue. There are people who are allergic to chlorine. There are people who are allergic to other chemicals. From a lungs point of view, no, there shouldn't be. Some of the chlorines, are, some of the pool chemicals can be quite smelly and overpowering. That's usually, uh, you know, you get a testing kit with your pool. You should be testing it every day for the chemical levels and for bacteria. And you really do need to be very careful about testing it, making sure the levels are correct. And if your levels are correct and you've tested the pool every day and there isn't a really big smell, then you should be OK. But if anything starts growing in the water, you should be cleaning it out and starting again. Sorry, I keep forgetting that I'm muting myself. I'm having a mad tonight, aren't I? Um, OK, we've got another one saying, Hydrotherapy, if you are lucky, you get in blocks of six. My child has not been entitled to any from the NHS for five years as it is seen as rehabilitation. My 13 year old will hopefully start treatment soon. When will the mindset or how we can educate local NHS workers that SMA is not a condition that gets progressively worse for everyone anymore? as there is treatment, so SMA children and adults can access better resources, not that they shouldn't have done any work before treatment. It's very frustrating when we know treatment works better with physio. Uh, what I don't understand is how they can say that you haven't had the, the, the powers that be can say that you're not getting treatment for five years because it's rehabilitation. It's rehabilitation for everybody. And uh, that doesn't make sense at all to say that you can't have hydrotherapy because it's rehabilitation. What is hydrotherapy if it's not rehabilitation? So don't put anybody in the pool because it's rehabilitation. What is it supposed to be? It's not a cure. It's not, you know, um, my generation, which is ancient, our grandparents used to go off to spas like Harrogate and Bath to take the waters. I mean, that was seen as curative and restorative. Uh, I, I don't understand the thinking to say you can't have hydrotherapy because it's rehabilitation. We know that. So where's the logic in saying it's rehabilitation? Then nobody can go in the pool, surely. What have they done? Closed it? Um, to me, that is a physio issue. I think the physios themselves need to get their act together. They need to um, be aware of the treatments that are around and the necessity for increasing exercise and physio to make use of the treatments. Uh, I know it comes in blocks of six. If you're lucky, you will get six on, six off or six every six months or something. If you miss one, toughy muffy, they don't make it up. That's it. You've lost it because somebody else is then coming in after you. It's incredibly difficult to get hydro. I appreciate that. Um, I think we need to try and support the hospices to open their pools and to somehow get them to be more active. I think we need to get education involved and get the school pools used in the evenings. It seems tragic that a lot of these special schools and some of the private schools have pools that are just sitting there doing nothing when they could be taken over by clubs or groups. Um, I know I, when I was working at Hammersmith before we moved to Great Ormond Street, there was a hydrotherapy pool that wasn't being used in a nearby hospital. And what we thought would be really lovely to get all the neuromuscular people who lived in the area, in the borough where this hospital was, what we thought of was a sort of hydrotherapy club 1830. We were going to staff it uh, voluntarily. Uh, it wasn't going to cost anything particularly just to use the pool. I mean, it wasn't going to cost the hospital anything because we were going to staff it and make sure it was safe. And all we needed to do was arrange transport to get five or six people to the pool once a week. And the hospital said, absolutely not. You can't do it and could not give us a justifiable reason for not setting up this club for 18 to 30 year olds to go swimming once a week. And it really is not acceptable. 
And I think we just need to be a bit more proactive about fighting these decisions that have no meaningful reasoning behind them. Okay. Um, do you know of any high therapy services that offer weekend slots? Um, all the high therapy services they can find are Monday to Friday, they work and they don't the say they only, The only ones I know of are the hospices. The only places where you can get weekend hydrotherapy are some of the hospices. Now, some of the hospices have not opened their pools up again for whatever reason, whether they're saying COVID or anything else. Um, but I don't know of any hydro pools that work at the weekends. Um, and again, it depends where you are as to where you're going to be able to find the facilities. Uh, some places have no hydrotherapy pools at all. Some of the small private hospitals, I know in Amersham, there's a hospital, a private hospital that has a hydrotherapy pool and I think you can go for sessions at the weekend and a few of the private hospitals do have hydrotherapy pools and may have some um, availability. So you may need to look to some of the private hospitals. As I said, some of the private schools have got pools that tend to be quieter and warmer. Uh, it's just finding the facilities in your area. Okay, um, last couple of questions. Someone has asked, is there a um, better time of day to be doing these exercises? Because they normally bath their child on an evening but they're already tired when this happens. Now, I was just about to say that because, yeah, in theory, the best time of day would be in the morning, but there's no time. Uh, it may be useful to stick them in the bath straight after they get back from school instead of waiting till bedtime. And then, admittedly, you're going to be in your pyjamas for the rest of the evening, but that's maybe not the biggest problem unless you are supposed to be jacketed at that time of day. Not very easy to wear a jacket in your pyjamas unless you are of um, the group that are in 23-hour-a-day jacket, which we don't, but that's besides the point. Um, what I would say is, yes, you're absolutely right. End of the day is a really bad time to be doing exercise in SMA. Mornings are better, um, but if it really becomes an issue, it may be, particularly in the winter, be quite nice, home from school, in the bath, do your exercises, and then just spend the evening in your pajamas if that's feasible. Okay, great. And final question is, there's a mum whose son wants to go swimming, with his friends after school, but the pool has a big inflatable in it and it gets very busy and very like splashy and she's worried about his safety. Should she let him have a go or is hydro a better option? I'm assuming we're talking about a type three here, um, who's somebody who's reasonably ambulant. Uh, I have no concept, it might be a type two. My only feeling would be that they speak to the pool and express their concerns to the pool, speak to the lifeguards, make sure that uh, the lifeguards are aware that I can understand what the mum is saying. I know there's a pool not far from us who that have one of those enormous inflatables in very often in the evenings after school. I think my feeling would be with COVID that it wouldn't be that bit busy and that splashy at the moment. And as the winter comes, might even be less so. But I would certainly speak to the pool because ultimately the child's safety, if they're on their own, is the pool's responsibility. So it needs to be that uh, the parent speaks to the pool and sees if there's any possibility of having any extra safety put in place for the child when they're there. Um, but other than that, I can understand the concerns. Those things can be dangerous. You can get stuck underneath them. They can, the kids can go wild, falling off them, jumping off them. You can just get hit uh, by a flying child. And yeah, that's fine if you're ambulant and, and physically fit, but it's not if you're not. So I think, yes, I understand the parents' concerns. I understand the child's frustration. I think the other thing to check out 
now that with COVID, whether they've even got the inflatables in the water, because obviously that might be something that they're a bit iffy with. So my feeling is first and foremost, speak to the pool and see what goes on. And then if you're unhappy and concerned, then no, they probably shouldn't be going or should be going to private sessions because there will probably be private sessions with that inflatable in the pool. Might just be a little bit more expensive. Yeah, I mean, I used to go with my friends after school on a Friday. Our high school kind of just invaded the pool. And my mum got my older cousin to go with me. So it wasn't like having a parent there, but they were older and they were responsible and they looked after me whilst I was in the pool. So if you've got maybe an older cousin or someone who could go with them, that could maybe work as well. Yeah. But it is nice to have that little bit of independence, but I certainly understand the parents' concern because oh, yeah. some of the kids come flying off those inflatables and that's as, as dangerous as being on the darn things. But the way those kids come flying off them, I, you, you do see legs in places where they shouldn't be and arms in places where they shouldn't be and, and it does get a little bit fraught at times, particularly some of the bigger, rowdier kids. I was going to say, and when they get bigger kids get really excited i can imagine a parent watching it you you will be quite scared for your child yes so. definitely and as yeah. i say there is a pool near us uh that has one of those crazy inflatables up quite frequently it is a very big pool and it's not a deep pool which at least is a positive but you know i can understand any parent being concerned if the child is not a strong swimmer or can't get out of the way quickly yeah. Well, thank you, Mary. We've got a lot of comments on here saying it's been very helpful. So good, thank good, you good. Very much. Okay, and if anybody's got any ideas for any more webinars, just give us a shout. Great. Thank All you. All right, take care. Thanks a lot, Marnie. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.